Hello, I'm Tom Hewitt, an MA student with the Open University. Now, since it was promised in the billing, let's have a look at this short clip. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Be quiet, please. What was that? I don't know, I was too busy talking a big nose. I think it was blessed are the cheesemakers. Okay, you'll perhaps not be surprised to learn that the real subject of my talk today isn't cheese manufacture at all, but in fact the concept of the fungal mycelium as a metaphorical analogue for a Deleuzean meaning space for music. But I thought that the cheesemakers were a better attention grabber and there is a serious point to be made about the clip later on. Philip Tagg has said that on average every day every person in the world spends the price of a loaf of bread on music. Clearly, Music is ubiquitous in all cultures, and that's something which must stand in need of an explanation. And, given music's ubiquity, it's no surprise that there is a constant debate over what music is and what it's for. Even a cursory glance at the literature in this area quickly identifies that ontologies of musical meaning fall into two types. Let's call them autonomous and heteronymous. I will say that all accounts of music's meaning are heteronymous, apart from the trivial case of natural meaning as described by Paul Grice. I think that all music is firmly situated in the cultural milieu. As Echo says, while fabric and code may be distinguished for analytical purposes in practice, signification encompasses the whole of cultural life. Accounts where the explanandum is one of emotional expression or structural form or semiotic content are not sufficient causes for the importance cultures place on the musical phenomenon. I don't find so-called autonomous theories wholly convincing in terms of the way in which I experience music, and so I'll propose a view of musical meaning which is firmly situated at the heteronymous end of the spectrum, a theory which places musical meaning in the wider cultural arena that which Christopher Small calls musicking and which Eric Clark calls environmental. Indeed, there's a study day coming up in Oxford this November whose broad theme is music as verb rather than noun. And in this account, I'll propose a metaphysical meaning space, metaphorically like the fungal mycelium. This space is built on the idea of the rhizome of Deleuze and Guattari, and it's the realm in which these cultural associative interactions occur. And lest it should be thought that this idea has been plucked entirely from the air, there are resemblances to things like the mind maps of Tony Buzan, which you can see in this slide, and Christopher Vitali's networkologies, and also the possibility space described by Jason Toynbee, which we'll consider a little later. If ever a question seemed to beg itself, it must be, what is the meaning of meaning? The Oxford English Dictionary online gives six subsenses of the nounal form of meaning, with a further ten subdivisions of those. Paul Grice writes about the distinction between natural and non-natural meaning. He gives as an example of natural meaning the expression, those spots mean measles. Could there be a natural meaning in music? Perhaps hearing the sounds of Beethoven's Opus 132 means, in Gricean terms, Four people are rubbing bows on the strings of two violins, a viola and a cello. But none of this tells us anything at all about the musical object or what it might mean. This natural meaning is the only kind of meaning that can be considered to be autonomous. So, if music has a useful meaning at all, it must be, in Grice's terms, a non-natural meaning, which is to say, heteronymous. The preoccupation of some with meaning in so-called absolute music, and indeed the notion of absolute music itself, has its germ in Kant's critique of judgment, and was developed by 19th century writers and critics such as Hoffman, Hanslick, and the greatest exponent of disinterestedness, Schopenhauer. This disinterested aesthetic approach involves a consideration of the work itself, its patterns, structures, and what Kant defines as its formal finality. Now, I've tried to approach both art and music in this disinterested, contemplative way, but
but I always fail. It's particularly difficult in relation to a temporally extended artwork such as a piece of music. It seems to me that this approach, even if successful, leads to a rather stripped-down appreciation, which is rather more ascetic than aesthetic. But perhaps I simply don't have my mind attuned in a suitably zen-like fashion. As Beard and Glogue say, for some, this disinterestedness, by implication of detachment, leads not only to a certain aesthetic purity, but also to a disengagement with the real world and the reality of artworks. It could also ignore the context, circumstances and beliefs that may conspire to influence our perception. And Roger Scruton says, It is important to distinguish the meaning of a work of art from its associations. We do not always do this, he says, since we are not always concerned to distinguish the meaning of a work from its meaning for me. Nevertheless, to say that a work of music is associated for me with certain feelings, experiences, memories, etc., is to say nothing about its musical character. Now, I would say that not only do we not always make Scruton's distinction between disinterested meaning and meaning for me, but that, in fact, we never do so. Music's meaning just is its associations, or, more precisely, the associations I and you make with it and about it. Disinterestedness is simply not the way most people engage with music on their iPod, radio, or at the concert or at a nightclub. It seems to me that any consideration of music which goes beyond the trivial case of the Gricean natural meaning is already firmly in the realm of the heteronymous. And even Scruton, given his remarks above, seems to want to have it both ways, because he says, The metaphor cannot be eliminated from the description of music, because... It defines the intentional object of the musical experience. Take the metaphor away and you cease to describe the experience of music. And what are metaphors, if not associations of ideas, descriptions of one object in comparison with some otherwise unrelated object? This is heteronomy. And at the level of complexity of, say, Agarwu's and Monel's semiotic approaches, or attempts to define music in linguistic terms such as Cook's, such descriptions are firmly in the realm of heteronomy. In a short paper, it's not possible to do justice to this ontological debate about musical meaning. All I would say is that whatever ontology is proposed for musical meaning, it needs to take account of the epistemological way the musical world actually works. Before I consider my mycelial take on Deleuze's rhizome, let's listen briefly to some sounds which I hope will give us a couple of hooks on which to hang the discussion. Some time back, I posted an extended version of the two clips you're about to hear a week apart on a student discussion forum. Initially, they were anonymous, just as you'll hear them now. In both cases, I asked students to listen to the extract and to respond to the question of whether they found any meaning in the music, and or whether the music was meaningful to them. Here's the first clip. If you didn't know what the clip was, you're in good company because only two of my respondents on the forum uh, actually knew what it was at the first pass. This is what um, one of those respondents had to say about it. Sadness, anguish, desolation, anger, questioning, anger again, revenge, memories, retelling a happier story, and so on, um, throughout the nine minutes of the actual clip. Um, you can scan down the slide and see what they had to say about that. OK, here's a second. Gothic's a good word for it. I've been watching a Time Team programme about Pugin today 
and thought this would be the ideal music to accompany such a programme. I guess I'd describe it as opulent and passionate. Whether the music has an intrinsic meaning or whether the performance gave it that feeling, interpretation, I don't know. There was a rhythmic motif in it that has been acting as an earworm since I heard it. Now, where have I heard that before? Which sounded like a reference. That first example was, in fact, the first movement from Beethoven's string quartet in A minor, his opus 132.